conference. We're really thrilled to have Dr. Harper with us. Um, and let's go ahead and just jump in. Bruce Harper is currently a research fellow in the Department of Human Ecology at the University of California, Davis. Her research interests are focused on the intersections of black feminisms, race theory, and food politics with particular focus on media rhetoric and educational technology used in the food and wellness sector. Using the analytical lenses of critical whiteness studies and black feminism, this lecture will explore how issues of food, health, and ethical eating in American veganism are informed by embodied experiences with race, gender, and legacies of colonialism. With that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Reese Harper. Hello, uh, good afternoon. Can everyone hear me well? Yes, okay. I usually start my lectures off with a song. I wasn't really sure which song to sing. Um, I like song, it's a way of knowledge that I was guess, raised with. You know, knowledge really comes to you in many different forms so for me, just music and learning about the history of my own peoples and struggles. Uh, I've been greatly influenced by Sweet Honey in the Rock. People know who this is. Okay, maybe I'm dating myself. But um, they are, they're a pretty phenomenal a cappella group of women of African descent, and the themes that they sing about are social justice oriented. And I'd like to start off with a very empowering song that talks about uh, where the ones we've been waiting for for change. So if you'll join me, I'm going to give you the gift of song. We are the ones, we are the ones, we've been waiting. We are the ones, we are the ones, we've been waiting. We are the ones, we've been waiting for. We are the ones, we are the ones, we've been waiting. We are the ones. We are the ones we've been waiting. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the ones. And then I go into this other song that's been inspired by a Panther movie that came out in 1996. Panthers, Black Panthers. We will not bow down to all racism. We will not. Sacred Woman 
and PETA are located within the landscape of vegan food politics that attempt to create cruelty-free and ethical spaces across multiple scales. Despite being vegan-oriented, these particular guides represent differing views of vegan commodities. Such differences are not so much about food as much as they are about the social, political, and economic relationships underlying the food commodity chain. An emphasis on commodity chains is appropriate for an engagement to explore how racial, gender, class, and sexual hierarchies operate and are represented within vegan food guides. Commodities represented in a capitalist culture falsely represent the spaces they come from and the unequal human and non-human social relations they produce. Analyzing these guides can also tell us what social, political, and economic meanings are viewed in the ingredients, i.e. commodities, and the preparation, and preparation these guides promote. Though ice cream in a vegan cookbook may seem like regular day-to-day -day items, materialist readings of these items reveal a lot about the cultures in which these items were created, such as ideologies and societal values surrounding race, whiteness, and gender. Within the aforementioned context above, explored will be the cruelty-free meanings that he applies to vegan convenience foods, and it marks it as a pedagogy of neoliberal whiteness, and how sacred woman constructs the identity of a liberated black woman as one who eats live vegan foods and abstains from the objects of colonial whiteness, while we look at sugar and chicken. PETA, as my initial site of inquiry, is appropriate, as they are the most popular and influential vegan organization in the USA. It is also PETA that shapes the debate about veganism and ethical consumption within American society. Sacred Woman by Queen Afua offers an intervention into PETA's framing of veganism, elevating the debate to include the significance of how racism and whiteness do influence vegan consciousness. I have concluded that the things that connect these vegan guys are how they affect and are affected by whiteness, both in its historical context, i.e. colonial whiteness or Jim Crow segregation, and contemporary forms, such as neoliberal whiteness, which I'll describe later. These connections will be revealed and articulated through the primary framework of critical race materialism, the lens of critical food studies and the science of these two vegan food guides. Now, there are many different ways to frame and analyze the phenomenon of race when engaging with critical race materialism. I have chosen black feminist, decolonial, and critical whiteness theories as the appropriate analytical tools to show how racial dynamics and ethical consumption are inseparable. I'll be using the term whiteness to articulate the conscious or unconscious promotion and advancement of the beliefs, practices, values, and ideals of Euro-American white culture especially when those cultural values are represented as a norm. This definition of whiteness is rooted in a genealogy of recent but strong canon of critical theory. Such canon articulates that contemporary whiteness is formed by heteronormativity, neoliberalism, Christianity, consumer capitalism, ableism, patriarchy, and upper class to middle, sorry, middle class to upper class sensibilities. I think this is important to know, so I'm going to try this out here. When I talk about whiteness, I'm not talking about phenotype, a certain physical type. I'm talking about that's just one part of it, it's the combination of the entire value system. And most of us are on a spectrum in that. You can actually be a person of color and still subscribe to whiteness as a value system. You can be a white person and subscribe to this as well. And you're all on a spectrum if you're living in a white style nation. It's very much at the unconscious level to the conscious level of how we kind of um, incorporate those values into our everyday being or try to resist those. So for this um, keynote, my engagement with these um, facets, I'm not going to look at all of them, I'll be looking at um, neoliberalism and consumer capitalism, heteronormativity and middle class sensibilities as my understanding of how it operates within whiteness and how it kind of creates this white identity. Influenced by critical race theory, critical race materialism asserts that formal imperialism and legalized racism were replaced with racial neoliberalism at the end of the 20th century. So neoliberalism is this idea that promised global justice for the victims of racialized colonialism by insisting that an open and free market, capitalist competition, and individual responsibility would create economic balance and prosperity for all, therefore eradicating racism. However, critical race materialism argues that racism was not eradicated, but in fact reconfigured in a way that fits the investments of the global north, mostly white population, 
and this reconfiguration is called coloniality. Though there are many other well-known animal liberation organizations throughout the United States, it is PETA that is the number one household name in connection to animal rights, veganism, and vegetarianism. PETA has over 2 million members and is the most recognized pro-vegan animal rights organization in the world. For PETA, choosing to go vegan is about moral obligations to non-human animals, as well as no longer remaining silent about the tremendous amount of suffering that animal-based commodities have created for animals. PETA should be understood as being a pro-vegan and animal rights organization first and foremost. PETA's founder and spokesperson, Ingrid Newker, believes that social justice activism based on identity politics cannot achieve liberation for animals. For her, human beings should be in solidarity with all beings and not focus on identity politics, i.e. in terms of what identity is African American versus we are all animals. Newker prefers the latter, that we are all animals. Furthermore, Newkirk prefers that PETA does not confine the label of women to only human beings. Instead, women should encompass all females of all species, such as the hens whose reproductive systems have been commoditized to produce babies that are then taken away from them for human consumption. Upon learning about animal exploitation, tens of thousands of people have chosen to become members of PETA. Central to PETA is teaching its supporters to buy vegan products as the ultimate signifier of being cruelty free. PETA's vegan shopping guide, which I'll refer to as VSG, teaches people that they can eradicate animal cruelty through ethical consumerism. On the introduction to their VSG, which is only accessible online, PETA writes, quote, it's never been easier or tastier to give your kitchen a cruelty-free makeover. Major health food chains chock full of animal-friendly fare are popping up everywhere, and mainstream supermarkets have become meccas for followers of meat and dairy-free diets. The best part, with PETA's shopping guide, you don't have to strain your eyes, end quote. PETA's focus on the kitchen as a site to stock ethical food products becomes a space to create an ethical vegan body. The kitchen also symbolizes the potential buying power of creating spaces of animal liberation from afar. However, who has such easy access to many vegan choices? On their produce shopping guide section, PETA has written, quote, it's as easy as apple pie to get your five a day. When you eat a vegan diet, fruits and vegetables are great sources of essential vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants, end quote. Yes, it appears to be obvious that produce is by default cruelty-free of animal products. However, what is not being made transparent is that the people who are able to follow this guide must have access to produce that will satisfy daily nutritional requirements. Such access typically includes well-stocked grocery stores and or farmers markets. Access doesn't just mean geographically close, but also includes monetary access as well. Now implicit in this guide is that everyone has the privilege of consumer choice, the money to enact it, and the geographical privilege to access these foods. Now this is a, there is a significant discrepancy between those who can afford and get transportation access to a diverse variety of produce versus those who cannot. Research about food access in the U.S. points to the phenomenon that those who have best and easiest access are predominantly white middle to upper class demographic. Those who do not tend to be non-white and or low income populations. Not only are the latter collectively unable to gain easier access to the diverse variety of produce, they are quite often the very people who work within the most underpaid, unequal, and dangerous spaces of food production that make the items in the VSG quote unquote easy as pie. But they are too poor to buy these foods. In addition, a significant number of low-income and communities of color simply do not have access to healthier food options, as these communities are overrun by liquor stores, fast food restaurants, and convenience stores. Despite the overwhelming amount of contemporary scholarship that shows how such structural racism and poverty impede food choices and access, this distinctly racialized and class reality goes unmentioned in the vegan shopping guide, as well as the entire PETA.org website. Hence, PETA's shopping guide acts as a map to navigate consumers to and through what they assume they already have access to, a well-stocked grocery store. Now, I will show next how the guide's language assumes that everyone has a white nostalgic relationship to and with food. So on the refrigerated foods section, refrigerated frozen foods section, PETA writes this introductory paragraph. Convenience foods can be lifesavers for busy families on the go. 
Veggie lunch meats are the perfect filler for a low-fat, high-protein sandwich, while veggie hot dogs and burgers with tater tots on the side will quickly become the kids' most requested 10-minute meal. Frozen burger crumbles make veganizing grandma's spaghetti sauce or secret meatloaf recipe a snack. End quote. The above paragraph is laden with language that symbolizes the authentic white American family culinary experience. As a marketing employee, it does make sense that PETA would select the aforementioned products as examples of what everybody yearns for when they think of American convenience foods. However, it is important to note that when not addressing a specific racial or ethnic group in the USA, the default marketing language in the USA is a universal or post-racial approach that is actually embedded with codes of neoliberal whiteness. Hence, an authentic American experience is a white, usually upper middle class, as well as heteronormative experience. Prepackaged and already made to buy hot dogs, burgers, tater tots, pot pie, and pizza, vividly ensure that going vegan means one will not lose access to these cozy comfort foods from the bygone era. Such objects of convenience have come to define the post-World War II white American identity. Such convenience foods were introduced to women as necessary items to please the bellies of their husbands and children. To become the new modern citizen, one was expected to adhere to the ideology that material accumulation is a sign of white progress and being civilized. Also, when Peter writes, quote, veganizing grandma's spaghetti sauce for a secret meatloaf recipe is a snack, end quote, it is a marketing scheme to signify nostalgia that grandmothers cook homemade foods for their grandchildren. Such nostalgia can be easily purchased through the promise of food technologies. However, who's nostalgia? There are many people in which the mention of grandma's spaghetti sauce and secret meatloaf do not, does not elicit the memories of their grandmother's cooking. For example, my grandmother and many other people of African descent experienced elders making traditional soul food, which did not include spaghetti and meatloaf. Such elders prepared meals that did not reflect pita's taken for granted whiteness which is assumed in PETA's marketing of vegan convenience foods. The aforementioned convenience foods also signify a collective American relationship with food objects that did not exist before, before World War II. Access to already made food on the shelves of grocery stores that completely obscures genealogy in the liberal market economy. The ingredients that comprise the perfectly packaged food objects start off as natural resources, i.e. plants or unfortunately animals. They then must be raised, farmed, cultivated, harvested, transported, processed, packaged, and ultimately sold to the new modern convenience shoppers. Mytholo mythologizing via branding obscures the injustice disproportionately enacted upon racialized minorities that harvest these resources. For example, who picks the tomatoes that end up as ingredients in the foods that PETA's frozen food guide section promotes as cruelty free? Although this is only a small sample, there are some of the, these are some of the brands approved by PETA's VSG. Amy's spinach pizza, Amy's roasted vegetable pizza, Moosewood Mediterranean tomato and rice soup, Tofuni pizza pizzazz, and Eve's veggie pizza pepperoni. What these products will have in common is the ingredient of the tomato. Tomatoes are obviously not from an animal. However, missing from the guide is a critical genealogy of the tomato commodity chain's role in sustaining the gender and racial exploitation of females under NAFTA. North America's access to tomatoes rely mostly on the labor of racialized and minority females, many who work in the most environmentally toxic and inhumane conditions to bring tomatoes to North America. However, to understand the implications of North Americans having access to tomatoes all year round, it is important to understand the intensive multi-layered genealogy of the tomato's roots. In what is now the nation of Mexico, colonialism destroyed the culture and the biodiversity of the indigenous people's land base and livelihood. Since European colonialism, indigenous people of Mexico were forcibly removed from the land, leaving most of them with only one option for survival, working for unlivable wages and relying on foods that are imported to them from the USA for their own sustenance. In 1994, the implementation of the North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, would also come to exacerbate problems of inequality and exploitation of indigenous populations, making it possible for North Americans to have even cheaper access to tomatoes all year round. NAFTA was conceived in order to create the world's largest free market, integrating the economic sectors of USA, Canada, and Mexico. 
Unfortunately, what NAFTA did was also allow the market interest to trump basic human rights of already vulnerable populations, such as indigenous Mexican laborers. NAFTA represents how global industry employs racist and sexist stereotypes about females to maximize profit. For example, there is an institutionalized belief that females make better tomato harvesters than maculadora laborers. And a maculadora is a person who works in the packing plants. This is not only sexual division of labor, it is a racialized sexual division of labor. Indigenous females are hired to work outside the fields, harvesting the tomatoes. However, none of the sorters or packers is indigenous, but rather a light-skinned species. Already using Mexico's racist colors and sexist beliefs about indigenous people, tomato corporations use the trope that indigenous women are closer to the land than nature. Hence, these women should be able to endure tremendous amounts of sun exposure, as well as pesticides sprayed onto the fields. They are also paid ten times less than the mestizos and the packing plants. Quote, Housed in deplorable huts, without water, electricity, stores, or transport, they come as families to work in the fields and move from harvest to harvest. Because their own regions offer even less opportunity, these women are forced to suffer these jobs by racist treatment built into them." End quote. NAFTA and the World Trade Organization are newer and ever-expanding mechanisms to help achieve global economic power for the USA, which began to cast transnational political economic issues in a newly racialized mold. This process reached new heights at the 2001 UN World Conference on Racism in South Africa, where the US did its best to undermine and marginalize the demands of global racial justice. Within the socio-historical context of European and American colonialism and imperialism, to undermine global racial justice means that it is still ethical to enslave and exploit a highly disproportionate number of non-white people of the global south for the economic and social interests of a largely modern white middle to upper class global north and their corporate interests. NAFTA is an example of sustaining an underlying narrative that there are permissible spaces of racialized gender suffering, and there are not. Simultaneously, the vegan cheese pizzas that VSG advocates suggest that it is not acceptable that cows suffer in farming spaces to produce milk for cheese, and to the creation of vegan cheese for pizza. Advocating vegan cheese pizza as cruelty-free allows PETA and its followers to be consciously anti-species. Simultaneously, they are unconsciously uncritical or unaware of the racist spaces and economic policies that make so many vegan commodities like tomatoes possible. It is noteworthy that the VSG or PETA.org do not provide one or two lines that ask readers to even ask food companies about the quality of life of the people who harvest their ingredients. They are only encouraged to think about the quality of life of the non-human animals. So the, tom the tomato, the tomato, tomato commodity chain is only one aspect of how racist, sexist, labor exploitation in NASA make foods promoted in PETA's guide possible. So um, I want to also talk about PETA's support in the vegan guide of So Delicious, which I know I love me, I love you, um, on their internet and website. So, on the first part of their vegan snacks page, they write, whether salty snacks or sweet treats are your passion, you'll find lots to love in the snack aisle. Most pretzels, popcorn, and corn and potato chips are animal free. Check the labels, you'll find that a surprising number of cookies, crackers, pastries, energy bars, and other snack foods are free of hidden animal ingredients. Chocoholics rejoice, it's all too easy to get your fix with chocolate cookies and dairy-free dark chocolate chips and bars. Now, Peter then proceeds to advocate over 150 snacks, including So Delicious, Chocolate Dessert, and Nestle Double Chocolate Thin Mints. On the, our favorite product section of VSG, So Delicious bread makes it to the top of Peter's list. However, this favorite Peter product holds a secret. There are thousands of children on cocoa farms who work as slaves to harvest cocoa from the global Western market. The Ivory Coast exports 50% of the cocoa beans that are used in global chocolate production. Despite the human rights violations that cocoa harvesting produces, PETA advocates Nestle chocolate snacks and so delicious frozen vegan desserts. PETA simply promotes them as cruelty free. In 2007, so delicious frozen vegan desserts are described as the following. Quote, 
While they're not a company big enough to purchase fair trade chocolate, Turtle Mountain doesn't use bone char refined sugar. They're certified organic. The company is also a supporter of the Sea Turtle Restoration Project, an organization helping to prevent sea turtles extinction. What better reason do I need to buy soy ice cream but to help sea turtles, end quote. If Turtle Mountain could not afford to buy from sources that guarantee no slave labor, I did ask myself three questions. Why didn't they stop purchasing cocoa altogether, or at least notify the consumers of the implications of not purchasing fair trade cocoa for their vegan desserts? Saving sea turtles and using sugar free from bone char refinement is what makes these vegan treats quote unquote ethical and cruelty free. Now it cannot be overlooked that the ethics surrounding cocoa and sugar for the turtle mountain and the consumers is not equally as important as ensuring that the sugar is bone char free and sea turtles are given the right to self-determination and survival. If it were, perhaps Turtle Mountain would have received enough complaints from consumers or boycotts to start buying cocoa that is certified slavery free. On the So Delicious product certification page, listed are the definitions of nine quality specific labels for the consumer, including certified vegan. None of the certification labels indicate the quality of treatment that the laborers receive. Even, through, even though the company claims to now use some fair trade cocoa, it is noteworthy that there is no label and definition for what for that quality attribute. And furthermore, everything about their product assures the customer that their purchases are guilt-free. All the images on their site convey images of joy and people consuming the foods or having a lot of fun consuming them. But missing are depictions of those harvesting the ingredients from Turtle Mountain and the quality of life that they have or do not have. On the community section, there are five images. <coughs> All pictures show white people in one mountain. The latest supporter of Turtle Mountain products is the Breeze family. Pictured on the website is NFL quarterback Drew Brees. Now, Breeze is holding nine different types of so delicious products as his wife feeds him a chocolate covered frozen treat. Turtle Mountain writes, quote, the donation amount is completely uncapped, so indulge away. The more delicious, creamy ice cream you buy, lick, and scoop, the more good we do together, end quote. Hence, one is receiving double satisfaction from the taste of dessert and by knowing that their dollars are supporting a good cause. To encourage one to buy even more Turtle Mountain products, 0.75% of net sales goes to the Breeze family's Breeze Dream Foundation charity. And my question for um, Turtle Mountain is, you know, they say they're keenly aware of the quality of foods that are important for people in America. And my question for them is, if they're keenly aware of how food affects a person's well-being, then what person are they referring to? Why isn't the consumer educated about the needs and desires of our commodity chain laborers, or the health of the communities from which these ingredients are extracted, harvested, and commoditized? And the answer lies in geopolitical consumer privilege. USA and Canada are where their products are sold. The person that truly matters is the consumer who dictates what the neoliberal market should provide for them. The well-being and quality of life of the harvesters of ingredients that have long been associated with racialized slavery, such as sugar, vanilla, coffee, cocoa beans, are completely invisible on this Peter Promoter website, as well as the vegan shopping guide itself. So even though PETA does promote itself to be dedicated to and making transparent how animals suffer for human gratification, they don't educate their supporters to think what cruelty-free cruelty -free means within a neoliberalist consumer capitalist economy. This guy fells the humans who harvest the vegan ingredients found in the product promoted by VSG. By not, providing in, by not providing any information to the winner about the commodity chain, the VSG signifies how a post-humanist approach to veganism generally masks a post-racial consumer culture invested in not really knowing where the product products originate. A byproduct of neoliberalism, post-racialism not only epitomizes PETA and its VSG, it also maintains structured ignorance about the significance of race and whiteness as organizing principles of the commodity chain. As a matter of fact, I would argue that <coughs> as a matter
matter of fact, I would argue that PETA is not consciously aware that they are doing this. But in fact, racism and whiteness are so deeply at the systemic, institutional, and structural level that it's difficult to even put together an organization dedicated to animal rights without this bleeding through. So that's kind of how I read the vegan items that have been promoted by PETA. And um, I let people know it's not like I'm attacking PETA, but it's kind of interesting to look at these items and see what they actually mean and how they come to us and why it, some items are pleasurable and cruelty free for some consumers. And if you're the person who's on the other side, it's what it's made and why they're not cruelty free at all. And uh, my next thing I want to talk about is Queen Afua's vegan diet. So, who is Queen Afua? In 2000, Queen Afua published the book Sacred Woman, a guide to healing the feminine body, mind, and spirit. Sacred Woman is a comprehensive guide that teaches black women how to become queen of their womb health through a live foods vegan diet. And as much as Queen Afua governs her life by the tenets of Afrocentrism, it is necessary to also use it to frame this discussion. Now, I'll be using Afrocentrism to explore how Sacred Woman teaches black women to consume or abstain from certain foods to liberate themselves from colonialism and racism. Claiming that Kemetic Egypt is the source of civilization, Queen Afua's Afrocentrism argues that the people of Kemetic Egypt were black. However, Afrocentrism resignifies black people as having a superior lineage that started with Egypt and not antebellum slavery. Normally in the USA, K-12 education, black people start off as slaves, which is not really good if you're a black person and you need kind of high self-esteem about your history. So this is like a counter-narrative that we're taught. And it's very uplifting for the black demographic to hear that black people who look like them started off in Kemetic Egypt. So Afrocentrism can be understood as a response to the centrality of white Europe as the taken-for-granted center of the world's intellectual superiority. The philosophy of African holistic health, which Afua is part of, has two related <coughs> things. One is a plant-based diet. Plant-based diet is the true diet of African people and not the industrialized diet, like sugar, dairy, meat. And the other belief is that to heal the black nation, black women must heal their wounds through comedic veganism. So to understand this and where this comes from, one has to understand how black women's bodies were positioned within a capitalist commodity chain starting with slavery. So the book Sacred Woman maps out an emotionally intense genealogy about black females and how they been brutalized through the commodification of their wounds rape, institutionalized sex factories, and incest. Queen Afua refers to black women as being damaged down to the DNA in her book. Now this implies that collectively, black females of the contemporary era are the damaged goods, commodities, that arose out of their socio-historical roles as black slaves in the creation of capitalist USA. They were constructed as unfeminine, breeding animals, and not fit to be human. However, Sister Vegan, sorry, Sister Vegan, sorry. <laughs> However, um, Sacred Woman re signifies queen and sacred and feminine as the natural attributes of the black woman in her womb. The Afrocentric vegan kitchen becomes the domestic space in which this re signification takes place. It is a symbolic site of womb empowerment and racial uplift representing the original power that black women had in the matriarchal southern Egyptian system that is central to Queen Afua's Afrocentric veganism. And what makes this very interesting as a scholar doing this is that her book is focused on the health of the black female womb. That's what veganism means for her and her followers. For PETA's guys, what's first and foremost are animals, not human animal rights. And there's a reason behind that, it's because Queen of who is people, black people, the reality of racism and the health disparities caused by that is very, very central for their activism. So veganism becomes this tool to decolonize the black body from those legacies of slavery, colonialism, and Jim Crow. And I found that really interesting when I looked at both guides and how that's basically absent, of course, from PETA and not absent from, from Queen of Fua's work. 
So I didn't analyze the whole book. I wanted to look at certain parts, mainly the food aspect. So um, Queen Afua, she has this chapter called Sacred Foods. And in this chapter, readers are asked to prepare their kitchen to employ the nutritional principles of Kemetic Egypt. And she says how, quote, you will need kitchen laboratory tools as outlined in this chapter, juice extractor, blender, stainless steel pots, herbs, wheatgrass, etc. And these modern culinary technologies become the symbolic weapons to achieve purification from the toxicity of colonialism. And that's the words she used, like, you must purify. Colonialism is toxic to your body. So the list of foods that she requires her followers to eat are things like vegetables and food, wheatgrass, sprouts, nut milks. And recommended are many fresh herbs for womb healing, such as dandelion leaves and watercress. The enemies against the womb for her are refined foods and flesh foods, and this contributes to intense emotional pain and anger and frustration. So Queen Afua prohibits many foods that she thinks will damage the womb and psychic health of black women. I think this is interesting because collectively she's part of the African Holistic Health Movement. And they construct sugar desire as an addiction. And um, analyzed through Queen Afua's work, we see that sugar has this history of not just enslaving people, contemporary people, but also sugar has this history of enslaving black people to harvest it. So African holistic health understands that black people in America today are still addicted to, um, to certain slaves to sugar, but not in the way it was you know, 400 years ago when they're actually harvesting it, but now they're eating it and it's damaging their health. So in the section of her book, uh, she talks about sugar as this addiction. And within the context of black women and reproductive health and the politics of motherhood, it's noteworthy that Queen Afua repeatedly tells her readers that you cannot eat sugar, refined sugar, or flour products because it's in the same category as cocaine. She actually breathes out of cocaine. And she says, check your diet for sugar, white flour, or cocaine. It's all the same if you're having womb health problems. So in order to understand the depth of how and why a food connects refined sugar to cocaine as the downfall of black community, um, I need to understand the history of both sugar and crack cocaine and the destruction of black people. African holistic health canon believes that both refined sugar and crack cocaine are utilized to enslave black people. So black people, first as child slaves, like I said, and then as kids addicts. So in the 1980s and 1990s, the mainstream media helped to create panic around the crack baby epidemic. Symbolized as poor black females, media would frequently narrate these women as prostitutes willing to do anything it takes to obtain crack cocaine. Essentially, such images symbolize that crack addicted mothers were no longer capable of having a natural maternal instinct to take care of their babies. The pregnant crack addict then was the exact opposite of a mother. She was promiscuous, uncaring, and self-indulgent. Now, despite the thousands of white females who also have been documented as being addicts, the prescription drugs, alcohol, and smoking. It was the black female who came to represent the addicted mother. So Queen of Fuwa's conflation with sugar and cocaine as the same object with the same consequences is multi-layered. Her anxiety around sugar and cocaine comes from social narratives in the 1980s and 1990s, which claim that babies born to crack addicted black mothers were irreversibly damaged. Now such damage was observed by hospital staff and their neonatal units who claimed that infants appeared to be detached and motionless. Quote, the crack baby then wasn't a natural as his mother. Just as the pregnant crack addict had no maternal instinct, the crack baby lacked an innate social consciousness, end quote. Now the anxieties that white mainstream society had about the black crack baby epidemic had much to do with the thought of an irreversibly damaged human being that could never be treated or rehabilitated to have a moral consciousness. So mainstream media produced myths that told the story of how much of a taxpayer's burden these black crack addicted babies would be throughout their lifetime. <coughs> that they would need the state to invest millions of dollars in them to control them and take care of their chemically induced criminal behaviors and physical birth defects. These are all quotes, they're not really criminal. A fool's rhetoric does not exist in a vacuum. Intentional or not, Queen of Fuwa's vegan rhetoric joins a history of female health performance who were committed to teaching lower class women how to birth healthy babies and to properly take care of their families. 
particularly through Proverbs and inspiration. A fool's suggestions about abstaining from refined sugar products and equating with cocaine and toxic behaviors also reflects anxieties about the objects consumed by lower class people. Earlier critical food scholars have, have observed that sweets are associated more with the lower socioeconomic classes, while bitters are more associated with socioeconomically higher classes. So next I want to explore how heteronormativity and middle class food reform and black racial uplift are simultaneously embedded in the meanings that Queen of Fua's Afrocentric veganism, the meanings of that Queen of Fua has ascribed to her Afrocentric veganism and culinary equipment, and in particular looking at the abstinence from chicken. So throughout the Sacred Woman Food Guide, Queen of Fua employs the nostalgia of pre-colonial African past and her black females to transition to veganism. So Fua's proper diet actually echoes much of the food reformist rhetoric of the late 19th century. A particular discourse embedded in it was that the assumption of a good citizen can be created by consuming the culinary values of middle class and heteronormative USA, obsessed with purity and hygiene. With the onset of domestic science, middle class women in the USA were taught how to create proper meals for their families. Heteronormative and middle class women's culinary knowledge became a naturalized benchmark of which the lower class was judged. Furthermore, by incorporating middle class cultural preferences into the seemingly empirical science of domesticity, the reform discourse normalized middle class values as a standard against which elementary deviance, now no small matter, could be measured. And this parallels much of the healthy culinary technologies espoused in Sacred Woman. A fool refers to particular foods and culinary equipment as either life giving or toxic. I referred to earlier um, in this talk, Queen of Fua wrote a list of necessary life-giving foods and equipment that her readers should have. You know, wheatgrass and Vitamix blenders and um, enamel pads and heat-proof glass pots. However, embedded in this ideology is a particular assumption about the reader, that she is financially stable enough to afford such technology such as a Vitamix blender. For example, depicted in Sacred Foods section is a picture of Queen of Fua and Elsa Bernal in a kitchen laboratory surrounded by many culinary technologies. And most notable is a Vitamix blender, one of the best blenders available on the market. And the price of the Vitamix blender with a wet container starts at approximately $450. A Fua is strict about her requirements as she dictates what are healthy cooking apparatus and what are not. For example, microwaves are condemned and cannot resurrect health. Yes, the concept of healing foods through holistic veganism may come from a pre-colonial era in Egypt, but access to these foods is also contingent upon living in the USA as a black female that has easy food access. Unlike the pre-colonial peoples of Egypt, a Fua's sacred woman does not consider the socioeconomic challenges of trying to afford such a resurrected diet in a capitalist country. In such a time and place, access to a healthier lifestyle is not only based on race, but socioeconomic class status. The microwave may seem like an unhealthy culinary tool for her liberating diet, but is also a class marker. Many females who are responsible for providing meals for their families or themselves may choose to use the microwave because it is fast and convenient. Cooking from scratch may be healthier, but it also takes more tools and more time. Queen of Fuo writes in one of her sections of her book, eat fresh organic fruits in their proper season. Eat fruits in solid form or freshly juiced. Canned or frozen fruit is forbidden to those who want a life of ever flowing blessing. End quote. Now, such a statement immediately assumes that black females have the monetary and geographical access to fresh fruits and vegetables. Afua does not explain to her readers that even though fresh fruits and vegetables may be the healthiest food choice, food choice in itself is a privileged location. Those who can most likely gain access to fresh organic produce are people who are middle to upper class, which I have mentioned before. And canned, frozen, canned fruits and vegetables and frozen produce are what most low-income people have easier access to. So a fool's position on all black females should ultimately eat a live foods vegan diet, using rather expensive food and equipment, is covertly suggesting that the culinary tools of low-income black women need to be reformed. So within the framework of Afrocentrism, sacred women 
Cohen succeeds as a decolonial methodology for black women. And simultaneously, Queen Afro's methodology not only reinscribes middle class values, but heteronormative notions of feminine and lady. Not one time throughout Sacred Woman does Afua offer the possibility that a black woman is romantically involved with another woman. Afua asks women how their wounds feel about their relationships and asks many questions, including, quote, how many men and what type of men have entered your womb space? What was each experience like, end quote. Several pages later, Queen Afua writes, quote, when things don't go smoothly in your relationship, don't blame him, just clean up from within. There's nothing wrong with him as a man or you as a woman. You are a divine couple by nature, wholesome and loved. What is wrong here is the fried chicken, spare ribs, and candy, the yams. The meat, the fat, the sugar that have us acting outside of our natural state of divinity. Toxic thoughts and attitudes are created by the poisons on our plate, end quote. It is noteworthy that black racial uplift, worthy of respect, honor, and nationhood, should be achieved through a proper relationship to meat. And mentioned in the last section, sugar. Although Afua admonishes all animal lives, I will give special attention to her condemnation of fried chicken. Afua's focus on not just any type of chicken food object, but fried chicken, joins a decades-long debate about liberation, black identity, and soul food amongst black people in the USA. The central focus of this debate has been whether or not black people can be liberated if they continue to eat fried chicken, the soul of contemporary black American food culture. Such a debate is not so much about chicken as it is about the differing lower versus higher class meanings that have been assigned to chicken as a food object. Sacred Woman's suggested abstinence of fried chicken is linked to a history of black middle class female food reformers. They taught lower class black women how to not only prepare chicken properly, but to teach them when and where it is appropriate to be seen eating chicken. For example, lower class blacks were advised not to let white society see them sucking on a chicken bone in public because it symbolized poor class and an inability to assimilate to white middle class etiquette at the turn of the 21st century. 20th century. However, as an Afuian inspired vegan, the proper relationship that black women should have with chicken is to not eat it at all, especially fried chicken. While particular ways of preparing and eating chicken signify a particular class of unnervous black people, fried chicken as lower class and baked chicken as higher class, um, was the way it was associated with, Afua's construction of chicken as toxic also creates two distinct classes of black people. It suggests that lower class blacks eat chicken while higher class blacks abstain from it. And what I find interesting about this is that there is no concept of you should not be eating chickens because chickens suffer. It's that chickens are just toxic. So central to Afrocentric veganism is that one should not eat chicken or should not eat pig or should not eat cow because they are dirty, not because animals suffer. So I found that very interesting in the Afuan food guide because there's really no reflection on how animals suffer. It's only about how meat products are toxic and toxic to the body. So there's this very much focus on health and also reclaiming the black body, but not that much focus on compassion for animals and that it's the reason that you don't eat these food objects because animals are suffering. And a lot of the rhetoric also talks about pigs should not be eaten because pigs are a dirty animal. Pigs are a dirty animal. Not, oh, actually pigs suffer. And I, I find that, um, those very remarkable differences. And um, I think that those remarkable differences kind of come from the fact that historically, African Americans have to think about their humanity first in a society in which they were not thought of as humans, but actually thought of as animals. And I mean that animals in a negative way, in a colonial way, that to be an animal um, is not equated with being a human or human animal. Um, so I found that kind of disturbing with the Afrocentric veganism and Queen Afua's rhetoric and her vegan diet. I find that for black women it is a very black feminist and um, creative approach to reclaiming the black body and trying to uh, find remedies to the health disparities that have affected the black community. 
But I also think it's interesting that um, when she talks about our womb health and how we need to reclaim our womb health through eating a vegan diet, that there is no mention uh, about maybe you can also think about becoming vegan because of the non-human animal wounds that have been exploited in a way that's similar to how women of African descent, that you know, they were enslaved and their babies were taken away from them. So um, basically in Afrocentric veganism, whether it's Afua's work or all the other scholars, those vegan guides, when they ascribe particular meanings to foods that should be eaten or not eaten, there isn't really a consciousness around animal liberation and compassion that I do find in PETA and their guides. But with PETA's guides, I don't really see the consciousness around what it means to be racialized as white or what it means to be racialized as a, a person of color in America and what that means with relationships to food and how one comes about their vegan practice. So with Queen Afua's work, and this is how I became a vegan, is because I was diagnosed with a tumor and I used her uh, vegan holistic guide to actually cure my womb of a tumor when I was like in my mid-20s. So I came into that and that was I connected to that because she had such a race-conscious approach to veganism. She writes how, you know, we're not gonna lie, like racism affects our lives, our psyche, our physical health. And she comes to veganism that way. With PETA, it's a completely different audience. And they don't necessarily want to talk about or think about these things because they're focused versus animal rights and veganism. So um, while I was looking at this, and I thank you for saying things, I'm still trying to figure out how to make the dissertation more, um, more palatable and um, easier to understand. So that was like me trying to figure out how to present these two opposing guys where like, both of these guys have their concepts of cruelty free, but they're both very different. So, you know, PETA, they don't, their job is not to talk about race or racism, but for them not to really mention how structural racism and whiteness are, they're, they're, they're I guess, they, they, they organize our society, they organize our minds, and it actually influences one's relationship to food and consumption. For that to not even be mentioned in the guide, or anywhere on the website that I can find, it's still in 2014, I think that says something. And for Queen Afua's work, where she's just like, we're straight up, post, we're not post-racial, we're race conscious, and we have to be. And this is how racism has actually organized the lives of most black women, and that we are in particular parts of the country where there's less resources, you know, we're less able to grow our own food because we're less able to have communities that are not living in polluted environments because historically you put communities that are low income and communities of color in the worst environments. So it's just hard for them to actually have access to the food that they need, the nutrition that they need. Um, there's a lot of assumptions made overall in the vegan health movement when there are suggestions made to improve your life. And um, I think PETA's guides kind of fall into that trap. And I know they're trying to attract a particular audience, which is the mainstream. But um, with my work, what I'm trying to, to show is that it's not that PETA is bad or good, it's just that that's one way of looking at how one comes to veganism and how, whether you're conscious of it or not, how whiteness and race and capitalism and consumerism actually drive you to a particular vegan ethic. And, uh, with Queen Afua, you know, she's not perfect either, but I think that's interesting. She's on the margins, but if you're someone who's trying to start a business and you're trying to reach out to more than just like the mainstream white population, it's good to kind of know how others have come to veganism and how to kind of market those products to them. And uh, with the sister vegan work, I, I, I employ a lot of black feminist theory, which is in this title of this talk. And black feminism just basically looks at, you know, how Black women's lives have been organized by race, class, and gender, and sexuality. And that's within the context of colonialism. So it's a particular type of feminism. And we're looking at things like um, the body and how the vegan body is assumed to be white, straight, thin, and able-bodied, and how work with it. And um, at the last chapter of my book, This is the Vegan, you know, we're, we're, we're having this black feminist conversation about body. And in black communities, historically, an actual larger woman is seen as healthy. So what happens when you become a vegan and you have a black family and like you're like me? Uh, I lost a lot of weight and I became very thin. And my family did not read that as healthy. And you know, most of the black women talk about 
healthy space. The body is losing weight, a lot of us will quickly become vegan and we do end up losing weight. Our families think that we're sick and that we're not healthy. And we see images of healthy vegans and they're always skinny and usually white. And for us, that's not comfortable. Um, I have a story of when I lost lots of weight. This is before I had three babies. Um, my, my father would tell me he to, to, to gain a good 20 or 30 pounds. So her, his association with me becoming vegan, eating vegan foods, and then becoming skinny was not positive. And when I visited my Dartmouth, um, it was five years after I graduated from Dartmouth, I visited. And me and the five other black girls from the 10th school um, in the early 90s were there. And they were like, give this girl something to eat. Give this girl something to eat. Like, where's your booty? And then my white colleagues were like, wow, because you look good. It was just like really interesting that I kind of, you know, how does that play out when you're trying to market to particular communities where not everybody has the same relationship to the body and food and what food's supposed to do and what health is. Um, and a lot of times, like, I, I was, I was, I have to say I was very much put off by PETA's way of doing things. Some people, that's, that's their thing. They love the PETA community. For me, it didn't. And it's not just PETA, there are, you know, I look at covers to magazines where it shows the healthy body, and it's usually a white, white person doing yoga. It's always whiteness or lightness. And, you know, I had the Sister Vegan Conference last September, and we talked about black bodies and yoga, and black women talking about how they're, these, they're larger black women, and how they kind of don't fit into this ideology of what's healthy. These women are vegan, they're, yoga, they're doing yoga, but they happen to have, you know, what would be considered um, overweight. So how do we talk about these, and how do we talk about how we all come to our vegan ethics when they're, when they're all driven by our relationships with you know, race and, and body size, um, and a lot of the vegan rhetoric that I've noticed as well, the, the ableist rhetoric, that if you don't eat a particular vegetarian or vegan diet, you will become disabled. And disabled doesn't necessarily mean someone who uses a wheelchair, that's a stereotype, but you know, if, you're, if you aren't vegan or vegetarian, the kids will be and that says a lot if you're living in a cultural, or, sorry, geographical location where you, as much as you want to give your kids the best, you, you just don't have access to those things. And who has access to make sure that your kids have the best? It's usually racialized in class. And um, my work tries to kind of talk about this, whether you're doing business work or whether you're just trying to do outreach about veganism to be aware of how you know, whiteness and race and class, all of this kind of structures your consciousness. And um, it's not, there is no really universal way to, to, to talk about veganism. You have to be careful, you have to actually um, be literate in the very different ways of how people live their lives and what's the best approach to talk about it. So for me, PETA was very off-putting because it never actually acknowledged that me as a black woman, I experienced racism all the time when I was growing up. And that was fundamental to my civil justice. So um, people like Queen Afua touched me more because she instantly, in her book, as soon as we read it, she talks about racism and its effects on black women's body and food choice. Um, so that's kind of what I want to share with my keynote talk. And um, it's a very complex situation um, that we're in in terms of understanding what's the proper way to do ethics. And um, I want to also explain to people that for me, because as a scholar, I talk to young people who want to do this work. For me, as I don't know if you can call I'm freaking nervous. Um, for me to talk about whiteness in a predominantly white institution, I'm like nervous. I don't know if you can tell, like, am I sweating like crazy? <laughs> it's just something to talk about because if you have students of color who want to talk about whiteness, even me, I have a PhD and I get hired to talk about it, I still get really nervous. And I was talking to some of the people who invited me. I'm a very open person. I was so nervous coming here because um, it's just like really difficult in certain situations to talk about this because um, I do get hate mail um, from people. Uh, seriously, I get hate posts um, when I say I'm doing critical race studies on this, and people associate, oh, you're looking at race, you must be a racist. Um, my work has been put on a white nationalist site to show, you know, that I'm a race baiter, like those type of things. So it's, within this climate, when I come to talk to institutions like this, which are probably why I went to two predominantly white institutions, um, I do, I am nervous. I am nervous, and there's just something that I want to show with you because I'm a very open person. And to do this type of work, it's important to know um, that a lot of scholars of color that are doing this need that particular emotional support. And just to know that. Um, and then second, I brought a newborn with me. And I've been nursing on demand nonstop, so I brought her from California. 
and um, she's somewhere in there. No one has come to give me the nursery yet, so I'm just really trying to, to, to do this work while raising a family. I have three kids under the age of five, um, and that's just something else I want to also talk about, too, is um, what it looks like to do this type of work, and um, also my food justice is nursing on demand. So what that looks like, and for me, it was, it was a very tough trip, but I did it because it's so important. And just like ways to think about when you bring speakers in um, and ways to make it even more accommodating for those who think food justice is nursing on demand and you want to bring your children. And there's a young person here too, I think about a three-year-old. You know, just having the kids come in and look at what we're talking about to get it in their consciousness at an early age. So those are the things I want to share with you. And I invite you to ask questions. Um, I know I went through this very quickly, but please do ask questions. And I'm open to anything you have to say as long as it's great. Thank you. Yes. 
Um, well, first I want to tell you I have such a beautiful voice. I want to thank you for singing. Oh, really? That's really wonderful. Um, and um, I also, you know, I think it was wonderful to listen to what you had to say. And I wonder, as um, you know, somebody who teaches animal rights, and one of the issues that sometimes comes up is, you know, African American students will feel like, wow, you know, we've been compared to animals, and now. And, and now you're not even letting us be superior to animals. Like, you know, give us some time. And, and I wonder what you think, I mean, what's the right or one right way of, of approaching that? Because I don't want to be alienating. And at the same time, I feel like there doesn't have to be an oppression. We don't have to be, you know, finding a way, someone to oppress and as a way of uplift. Yeah, like, I wish I had the answer because I'm still trying to figure that out with my mom. Um, but I think it's very complex, and I think you can get people to start thinking about it, but you may never actually get someone to completely agree with your perspective. Um, what was helpful for me was pointing students um, toward, I guess, it's not like queen, but what was helpful for me was just to um, point a lot of my, um, I guess, the black females that were interested in my work um, toward Queen of Fula's work. Like, starting like, trying to get them there as, like, she doesn't necessarily look at the animals, she maybe mentions it a few times, but to actually start with that, uh, put them there as their, their starting point, because she kind of starts from where they are. Um, and then what I also did, you might want to suggest this to vegan to them as well, I like, had a lot of black women actually tell me that I, I never made the connections to my own health suffering and then what's the point of veganism for animals until I read Sister Vegan? So, I mean, I would actually suggest that, just anthology. Because sometimes it's hard to actually convince someone with theory or this is what the science shows about animals. And a lot of people connect, I think, very well to just, like, stories. And especially stories about people who are like them. So, I mean, I, I would kind of suggest that. And, um... Do you want to make a, just a quick uh, explanation of the book as well? Oh, I'm sorry. That's true. Um, so, uh, thank you. <laughs> Um, so Sister Vegan is the anthology that I edited um, four years ago, about four years ago, four years ago. And I'm there in Lantern Books, um, publishing. They're awesome. They're awesome. You can check out those. Uh, and it's an anthology of uh, black female vegans and they're speaking on food identity, health, and society. And uh, I think it's a, a really good collection for not just black women, but anyone who's interested to, to look at veganism beyond that single issue of just animal rights and to see why there are some women in here who only look at it from the perspective of health and others. And there are people, there's um, a great chapter in here by I am Drew who talks about how she worked for PETA and how PETA didn't quite understand the prevalence of um, racialized health disparities in the black community. And they're only focused on let's, let's target the black community and ask them to stop wearing fur. And she talks about you know, how she doesn't really know how to come to terms with that. Eventually, Peta asked her to leave because um, she didn't agree with her politics. So um, for you, I think you can just kind of point students to the information and in, like, creative ways to explore it. And I know it's frustrating sometimes if people just don't change their minds overnight. But I would suggest maybe the system being anthology. And um, I have my, my dissertation, my full dissertation, actually talks about um, why black people may not be comfortable with being equated with an animal. And um, it's not that black people are not open collectively to being animal rights activists, but it's the language is, that's used, it's still very, the language is still within a system of whiteness. And the language is just, it's difficult for someone to say that we're all animals when like, you know, black people have not been afforded like full humanity yet. But I know that's still thinking within a species framework, but at the same time, a post-humanist framework kind of neglects that we're still living in, not in a post-racial era, but an era of structural racism where many non-white people are still seen as the colonial sense of the word animal. You know? So um, my dissertation worked through the chapter that kind of talks about that, and um, maybe, it, I think it, it can kind of help with students. I don't know, have you also shown them like the suffering that animals actually go through, like visually? A little. I, I try to avoid doing too much of that because yeah, I think much. it's traumatic for people. Yeah. I'll, if you email me, I have a, um, which went really well, a, a talking about vivisection and how black women were actually, um, you know, the doctor of gynecology, the father of gynecology. Yeah. yeah, how he actually, you know, did a vivisection on black female yeah. um, slaves without anesthesia. And um, I talk about that and, and, and how non human animals have to go through vivisection as well and kind of trying to, you know, 
build solidarity, you know, with people. And I got a lot of good responses from that as well. So if you email me, I can send you that video, that talk that I did. Okay, sorry for the long answer, but. Good. I guess this might be beyond the purview of your focus, but I, I was listening to an interview the other day with an African American professor whose focus was public health, and she was discussing the health disparities between the white population and racial minorities. Mm -hmm. And her her comment, she wasn't coming from a vegan perspective, but her her essential message was that these health disparities will never be remedied simply by dietary changes because the ultimate cause is structural racism. Mm -hmm. And until so that underlying systemic racism um, is, is changed, you know, the health disparities will never be narrowed. So I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. So like Sacred Women, Queen of Fu's work, or if you just look at all of Afrocentric holistic health, um, food is only one part of it. So they're talking about Change cannot be made unless it's on the structural, systemic, and institutional level, so I totally agree with that. Um, I think with food, you know, a lot of people say if you just change food, your health will be better. But, you know, what if you're one of the communities that live, you know, in a place where it's toxic? So, you know, there's this um, discipline called environmental justice, and it's looking at how communities of color are affected by food areas. And uh, you'll find if you live there, most likely if you you know, find an incinerator, incinerator, you'll find a community of color near one. So even if you eat really well, but you're inhaling all this incinerated stuff, how will your health be really good? And why are they positioned there? And how is it, you know, that there's so many people of color don't have access to the land and resources they need? Well, if you look at it historically, and when people apply for mortgages and loans, and like after the war, who was given the best land, um, the easiest to get, to get houses and stuff? So you see that generations later, that that affects the capital that one needs to even try to become healthy. So I totally understand what that person is saying. And I kind of look at Buddhism as a platform to discuss structural racism. So food is just one aspect, but the problem is that the whole system has to be overhauled. And the bigger problem is that those of us that are benefiting as not just as white people, but um, consumer privilege, you know, if you overhaul that system and you change everything, then what does that mean for those of us that are there? You know, and I think that's what I'm saying. Like I'm, I'm, I have experienced racism, but I also have all these other ways of privilege that give me better choice and better access to the resources that those without that class they don't have. So if I were to overhaul that, I'm scared. What does that look like for you and me? So I, I, guess, I guess your question is kind of like holistically, but that's my answer to your question. But I do believe that one can't get trapped that there's only food, one food way is going to solve the problem. I think the problem is structural and systemic. Yes? I, I really enjoy your talk too. I just have a, a, a small comment or some thought. Mm -hmm. um, part of what you're, the critique of PETA is sort of what they're saying, mm -hmm. but it's also sort of what they're doing. Right? They're promoting uh, foods that are, um, they, they may involve much less suffering with respect to animals, but not with respect to people. Um, I think if you look at sort of labels on packaged foods in general, yeah. I would bet that if something says vegan, it's more likely also to say fair trade, uh, organic, non-GMO, and other you know other things that we might think of as markers for less harm to the environment, to humans, etc. Although not necessarily. But I wonder whether that you know see, putting, asking to put all of that on sort of exacerbates the first problem you identified, right? Which is it just makes it more expensive and out of reach of a large portion of, of the. Um, so you're asking about the marketing scheme that the marketing schemes are, are put on these products. Not just the marketing scheme, the product. No, if you actually take it seriously, right? So yeah. if you, it costs more to pay workers. The, the product that is the product of paying workers a fair wage yeah. has a higher price, right? Mm -hmm. And the and so that's going to make it harder for people who have less money to buy. It. Okay. So I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that therefore they shouldn't do it. I'm just yeah. saying that it seems that the first observation, right, that is that the the vegan uh, alternatives to comfort foods are generally available for people of means gets exacerbated when we want to say you should also care about the workers, right? Yeah. I, I'm I, as again, I'm not saying that we shouldn't do that. No, I I'm just saying it's a problem. It's a yeah. problem. These are at odds. Yeah. So. Um for my work, what I'm critiquing is
is that I'm not expecting them, and I expect everyone to be able to afford that. I guess what my critique is that they don't even mention that. So um, I think PETA is, they're very influential. So if they can just say, oh, by the way, it's not perfect now, but you should also think about the fact that, you know, children are enslaved for child chocolate. So like if, I don't even know what, there are like three million PETA members. Like just imagine if all three million members knew that. And they themselves want to enact change through their own activism or doing a petition to make sure that, oh, Nestle, stop having kids harvest chocolate. So that's, I was thinking more of along those lines, not necessarily now why can't PETA just mark those products or, or target, sorry, uh, pr promote products that are vegan, cruelty-free, um, you know, fair trade. Uh, I, I don't want them necessarily to do that. I want them to actually start getting people to think beyond cruelty-free only means no animal is used. But I do know the problem with that is that, as it stands now, is that people who can afford those things usually have higher economic class. So that is like prohibiting. Um, but I don't know, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just hoping that, just looking at that, that people will start thinking, well, why does that have to be an economic class to have a right to access things that are fair trade and that there is no you know, sweatshop labor involved in it? So I'm thinking more or less, I'm hoping these ideas will start kind of making more structural and systemic changes. But yeah, I don't expect PETA to kind of, I don't expect people to be able to afford the things that you're talking about. It's more or less, PETA should be at least putting a few sentences in there to get people to start thinking that cruelty-free doesn't just mean no animals harm. Mm -hmm. Yes? Is it possible to eat ethically? I get that question all the time. <laughs> um, I don't think there's ever any 100% ethical, but I also think that at least America is not trying enough. I actually don't think that. And I also think if you ask the question from the person who's being enslaved or the animal that is being hurt, I think the animal or the person being enslaved would probably be like, yes, then please hurry up, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a hard question to answer, and I also have that problem because I, I by default, I'm exploiting a human or a non-human animal just by being in America and the way things are configured. I understand that. So I think to answer your question is that you can be on a spectrum of always trying to go toward the most ethical way of living, but I can't necessarily say what will achieve it. But I think the mindfulness around trying to go toward that direction is probably what counts the most. That's just how I can answer you. Um, for me, I remember this is subjective because I'm, like, I have a PhD and this doesn't mean that what I say is, is the end all be all. But for me, I'm like, I think just having awareness around that and trying to go toward whatever one thinks is most ethical is probably a good start. But I think, once again, that's also subjective. Like it's really hard to to find is there an actual one universal ethical way to eat, and that's my one of my dilemmas as well. Is how does that work? What would a could someone eat ethically who lives here the same as someone who lives somewhere in you know a completely different part of the world with with completely different systems of how food is harvested, different climate? Like that's where I get lost. Is is it even possible? I'm gonna say is it even possible for the whole world to be vegan? <coughs> how does that work? What does that look like? I don't know. But whoever has the answer to that would be probably get the, the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, uh, yes, yeah, with the scarf. I want to also thank you for coming to speak to us. You're welcome. Um, I've got a question, I think, really of, of the Queen of Philip book, which is it sounded like there was this conflation of women's health and women's reproductive health. Can you speak about that a little bit more? Uh, yeah. Um, so the focus, which I think is interesting, um, the focus of her book is. Okay, so the womb, the black female womb, was a site of nation building 500 years ago. And by that I mean you enslaved black women and you exploited the reproductive system so they could birth more slaves to build a capitalist economy. <coughs> and um, that's kind of where Queen Afu is coming from with her work. And she's saying, I want to reclaim the womb health because if you heal a womb men, you heal the nation. And um, I have a lot of problems with that rhetoric. Uh, but I also find it interesting because it depends which framework you're looking at. So if you look at it in the framework um, of Afrocentric upliftment, you look at how women's, black women's bodies, who had a womb, were um, commodified. So for her to actually say you're gonna, your womb is queen, your womb is center, that is a form of activism against white supremacist you know, ideologies around the state of the womb, black women's state of the womb, okay? But I also have a problem with um, that a real woman has a womb. You know, a real woman, you know, this is where we get into um, transphobia, we get into uh, assumptions about um, what makes a woman a woman, and what makes, you know, uh, a healthy black woman a healthy black woman. 
And um, it's interesting when you look at her, how certain foods are conflated with um, a proper sexual, civil behavior. And it's always, you know, if you eat this particular type of food, you as a, I assume, um, cisgender privileged woman are going to be in a relationship with a cisgender privileged man of African descent. And then you're going to build this healthy family because you're in a sacred relationship, which can only be through heterosexual coupling through marriage, and then you're actually eating the proper vegan foods to create this healthy black family that are not like the black families that were eating fried chicken and eating sugar. Like it's just, it's like, it's hard to kind of, it's not like just single, it's all how it's connected. Um, so that rhetoric I find really interesting, and it's also, it's very marginalizing for those of us who identify as queer. So, you know, or if, even if you're in a heterosexual relationship, like my, my partner is white, so what does that make my children? Are they not real black people, even though they eat vegan food? You know, it's just like all of these interesting things that people don't start to think about when you start thinking about what's ethical eating and you think you're creating a more just society, but you're falling into these, what I call the traps of normative whiteness, where, you know, a proper white civilized nation, you have heterosexuals, everyone is, you know, heteronormative, um, they're able-bodied, they're Christian, they um, promote capitalism, all these things. So what happens when even someone like Queen Afua who is race conscious and wants to decolonize the body still does it through, I think, a lot of you know the facets of normative whiteness that system. So I think when you start talking about you know a true woman starts at her womb, well, what about those who identify as women but don't have a womb? What about those who um, actually think that there are other parts of their body that are more oppressive or more important? Um, what about those who don't ever want to have children? You know, like to, to kind of circle, center on that, I can understand reclaiming that because of it was being commodified through white supremacist capitalism. But how about looking at other frameworks and who does it marginalize if, you, if you're only focusing on building a healthy black nation through that rhetoric? So that's kind of what I look at the book. Like I appreciate it because I ate the regimen that actually cured my fibroid tumors and all these other health things, but I also felt like it wasn't completely the book for me because I felt marginalized because I identified as bisexual. My husband is white and I'm not doing these things that Queen Afua thinks I should be doing to become the more better, more civilized black person to build a new black nation. I said that really fast, but that's kind of what, what her work, well, I have problems with her work, but no one's perfect, that's the thing. Like, no work is perfect, so I'm trying to get what I can out of PETA, get what I can out of her work and other people's work, and that's the point of kind of looking beyond your own comfort zone and looking at all these other guides and what other people are doing, whether you, you agree or not, and kind of take what you can with it to maybe go toward a, 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 a more just world. I don't know if I'm, did I answer your question? No, yeah, but my, my dissertation work, I have a chapter that's completely dedicated to looking at, you know, the pros and cons of Afrocentric veganism and the problems of, of what happens when you already assume that a healthy black woman is this. We have time for one more question and then for that. Yeah. Um, I would add, add to that is to also acknowledge that there are those, like purchasing is um, a privilege if you have the choice to actually purchase these, uh, but also to do the work of food justice. So there's a difference between um, the slow food movement and like good food movement and then food justice where um, it actually advocates an awareness around well, not everyone can afford this, not everyone has access to this. So it's cool to buy these things, but also be part of movements that make it so that everybody has access to just healthier foods and um, more ethical foods. Yeah, so like the consumer part is only one aspect of it, and that's the part I look at. Uh, but there's also many people that are doing food system reform that don't include just consuming the product, just buying it, but you know, doing policy change or uh, going out and to their neighborhood and trying to, you know, reclaim land and have their own community gardens. Like in Oakland, that's huge in Oakland, California. A lot of the, the minority populations that cannot afford those 
more expensive fair trade organic items, starting their own co-ops, um, starting their own nonprofits to get funding to try to um, bring in um, people to teach about nutrition and health, to teach about actually um, people's own unique, I guess, ethnic food roots. So that's a big thing too. So just like that whole thing is not the cons consuming the food, buying it is just one piece. The other piece is being more engaged in this concept of food justice and making structural changes. So that's kind of what um, the, the last part of my dissertation chapter actually talks about, which I don't talk about here, is kind of shifting away from that. Just buying with your dollars. What if you can't buy with your dollars? What else can you do? What else can you do? Please join me in thanking Dr. I hope I recorded. <laughs> 